Hey everyone, welcome to the Active Towns channel. I'm John Zimmerman, and today I have something very special. I have two guests on the Active Towns podcast. It is Gary Hardy and Ole Kessau. Uh, Ole is the founder of Cycling Without Age, and Gary is one of the affiliates, one of the heads of the uh, chapters for Cycling Without Age in Lakewood, Colorado. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive right into it with Gary and Ole. Enjoy. Absolute pleasure to welcome into the Active Towns podcast uh, a very good friend, Gary, and also Ole. Ole, you're joining all the way from Copenhagen. Thank you so much. And Gary, you're coming in, dialing in from Lakewood, Colorado. Hey, welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So uh, what I love to do is to give my guests uh, an opportunity just to you know quickly introduce themselves. So uh, let's let's. You know, have you kick it off, uh, Gary? Go ahead and, and introduce yourself. Tell folks where you're from and uh, what inspired you to be part of the Cycling Without Age organization. Yeah, thank you, John. I've lived in the Denver metro area most of my life uh, since the age of three. I've been involved in bicycle advocacy and bicycle safety education now for almost forty years. I've done some racing, some self-supported touring, uh, touring supported by a credit card. So I've done a little bit of everything. I started the bicycle advisory team of Lakewood in 2015 to address what I felt were some of the shortcomings of bicycle infrastructure in the Lakewood. You know, at this point in my life, the bicycle represents the most sustainable form of transportation, both for my health and for the health of the environment. It was through the Lakewood Bicycle Advisory Team that, you know, we're sharing videos with other advocacy groups. And it was in 2016, right around Thanksgiving, that I saw Ole's TED Talk, which I believe was recorded in Norway in 2014, two years after the founding. And I thought, boy, I have to get involved in this. And I futzed around for two or three months trying to figure out how to do it. And finally, I just took a flyer and applied for a chapter and thought it would take a lot longer to be vetted and approved. But it, emails get across the Atlantic Ocean incredibly quickly. And in three days, I was approved for a chapter. <laughs> so, so then the fundraising began. I'm gonna pull. I'm gonna pull up the the, the main page here and uh, reference. Yeah. So here is that TED talk uh, that that Ole did, and so it's it's wonderful to to hear that uh, you know the power of the internet, the power of videos that we have out here that we're putting pushing content out. It does reach all parts of the world and inspires people to to. To move forward and do things, so let's shift over and 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 have you uh, you know kind of share your story, Ole, and and how you came to you know really be inspired by this, and uh, we'll, we'll get more into the deeply into the the history. But why don't you just give a, a real quick uh, introduction of yourself of uh, where you're from and maybe that very first kernel of inspiration? Yeah, well, first of all, thank you so much, Gary, for. Uh for the kind words, but and also I'm I'm so inspired by what you what you've accomplished over the years and and you know the forty odd years of um, of bicycle advocacy in uh, in the greater Denver area, um, and I, I think that was also part of the reason why uh, you got approved in such a, a short space of time back in in 2015. So my own journey with cycling without age started back in in 2012. Um, I had been involved for a, a period of time in, in bicycle advocacy in, in Copenhagen as well. And, and of course, Copenhagen is, is, is known as the city of cyclists, but even Copenhagen was not always Copenhagen. Copenhagen has a lot of shortcomings and a lot of things that need to be changed and a lot of people who are kind of pulling in different directions. So um, I was involved in setting up something called the, the Bicycle Republic in, in Copenhagen, which was uh, all about creating a lot better environments for cyclists and also to take Copenhagen to the next stage as well. Um, and it was during that time that I uh, also got uh, inspired by the, the bicycle culture of, of yesterday. So, you know, you go back to the 1920s and 1930s and there were 
probably two or three times more people cycling in Copenhagen than today. And today, it's it, the numbers are still quite high. But back then, you know, you could hardly move with a car through the city of Copenhagen uh, because of all the cyclists. And it was just a wonderful sight to see the pictures and the, the video footage from back then. So I got the feeling that there were a lot of people who had been cycling a lot and, and weren't cycling anymore. And I, I also noticed that there weren't a lot of elderly people and people with limited mobility in the cityscape. And and I started wondering why that was. Um, I also, uh, from my own childhood, had a, a dad who suffered from MS uh, for many years and who was in a wheelchair. And I knew firsthand the, the challenges of, of, of having a lack of mobility. So I got the idea that I wanted to see if I could get elderly people back on a bike. And I got uh, particularly inspired by a gentleman that I kept meeting uh, who was sitting on a bench in front of a, a nursing home next to where I lived. And and so one day I showed up with uh, like a, one of these uh, traditional cargo bikes from Copenhagen that had been modified to have a double seat in front. And I, I rang the doorbell uh, of the local nursing home and offered them the opportunity for some of the elders to get back outside to feel the wind in their hair and uh, and just to have a good time to be all reconnected with their local community and i was lucky enough that um that they said yes and they offered me uh, one of the residents and one of her friends to bring them outside um and and that moment i guess changed my life because that uh, had a profound impact on on both people getting outside the elderly people who were in they were in their late 80s, um, they just had such a great time and they they, they chatted all the, all the way um, and, and one of them, Gertrude, she was actually had stopped talking. And so when I came back, the, the, the staff could hardly believe that she had been chatting nonstop for an hour and talking about her local community. So that was a, a, a great inspiration and that made me realize there was something, there was like a little gold nugget here that I had to keep searching for and had, had to figure out, you know, how is that going to work? Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of how it's going to work, let's go right to a visual here, which I think will really drive it home for the audience as to what it is we're talking about and what this contraption kind of looks like that you're describing there, Oleg. Is, yeah, it, 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 it's wonderful. you got this side by side. Uh, carriage opportunity here where uh, the, the trike shaw is set up so that, you know, you can throw a couple people in front and be able to, as is said, you know, on the, the website, you know, be able to, to get some wind in their hair <laughs> and be able to feel that spirit. And in fact, if I go to your webpage here and uh, and the dream that is is really in, encapsulated here, it, it really is kind of looking at this this opportunity to make a profound difference. And so, you know, it's it says literally on here that we dream of creating a world together in which the access to active citizenship creates happiness among our fellow elderly citizens by providing them with an opportunity to remain an active part of society and local community. And what is interesting is that especially in a an environment like Copenhagen and probably many cities uh, around the Netherlands where their mobility, their their ability to get around town and be able to meet their daily needs very may well have been on bikes. And so it's really it's it's if they get to that stage where they're no longer able to do that, either through, you know, just through age or uh, or as you mentioned, you know, a, a, a debilitating uh, disease such as MS or anything else. This sort of this makes a huge difference for, for those individuals. But then as Gary can, you know, chime in and talk about it also means a lot for, you know, elderly and, and other individuals here in North America and other cities where we're much more car centric, uh, it has a massive impact as well. Talk a little bit about that, Gary, in terms of that impact, because when we look at that ability to really impact the lives of, of folks that maybe they weren't really cyclists, but at the same time, you, you, the smile on the faces really say it all in terms of you know, what a profound impact this has. Yeah, this, this particular image is was taken at the first 
North American Summit of Cycling Without Age in Oshkosh, Wisconsin. And Oshkosh has the distinction of being the first chapter in the United States. And so Ole and some of the staff came over from Copenhagen, helped them set this up. And you're, you're looking at three pilots and one, one of the residents of uh, Miravita Living. And of course, she and I connected right away. We're enjoying the National Football League playoffs right now. And she was a Green Bay Packers fan. And <laughs> right. I happen to be a Green Bay Packers fan as a youngster. So yeah. we, we had a lot to talk about. And yeah, we, at that point, we're experiencing wind in our hair. And before the ride was over, we were also experiencing rain in our hair. So it, it was just a great adventure. If you could pull up, there's a picture of my family. Uh, looks like it's in the woods. And my mom is sitting in a tri shop. Th this particular scene is almost out our back door. There's a very short green belt with a bikeway on it. And we moved into this townhome in 2014. And because of my mom was on oxygen and had uh, neuropathy in her feet, that little trail is completely inaccessible to her. And it being Thanksgiving, you know, we like to get out for a little bit of a walk rather than sit and watch football all day. And with the Trisha, my, my mom's able to join a, in a family activity. So, so that's my mom sitting in the Trisha. I'm uh, piloting uh, to my left, right side of the photo is my sister, her husband, and their daughter. Uh, I have a cousin and her husband, and my son is standing next to me, and my daughter is uh, standing next to the Trisha. And, and this is just this beautiful area. It's not very long, but uh, like I say, you know, after a Thanksgiving meal or before a Thanksgiving meal, it's good to get out for a little active exercise. This was inaccessible to my mom, but for the Trisha. And uh, just just one of those special memories. My, my mom's not with us anymore. I, I know Ole's gone through a similar experience and uh, we, we treasure the times we could spend together and enjoy things like this. Yeah, yeah. So Ole, when you look at what has transpired uh, in in that period of time, so some from 2012 until now, I mean, it's you've been going on for uh, about a decade now. Talk a little bit about what that was like and what that scope was like, you know, going from this this kernel of an idea to now whether where you're you literally have, you know, I, what do you call them? What, what do you call these offshoots or these uh, chapters or, or whatever they are all around the world? What's that been like? Yeah, it's true that there are chapters and some people say, so are you a motorcycle club or <laughs> what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> sure. But we've got a quite fitting, you know, these are bikes. These are fine, fine bikes. And of course, they're really good quality because they're, they're carrying precious cargo. But yeah, it it does it did have quite a, a, a you know a surprising growth over a short period of time, and I was completely surprised as well because I didn't think this was going to work anywhere outside of Copenhagen. But I've come to realize as well that the bicycle has something magic uh, when when you are on a bike, and actually we do these amazing workshops sometimes with elderly people, and we do it with people of all ages, but um, I take people through the time machine. So I invite them on a, on a time journey. I ask people to close their eyes, and I've done this with literally hundreds of groups of elders in their 80s and 90s and even over 100. And what we do is we travel back to the day when they got their first bicycle. And I ask them to go outside, get on their bikes, and now they're back when they're maybe three or four or five years old and they're riding their first bike. And then I, you know, I asked them to, to pick to themselves a few years later when they're out siding, out, out riding the bike in a, in a forest or the, the path of the neighborhood. And then I asked them to just feel, you know, what is the feeling they have? What, what emotions are going through them? And try and encapsulate that in one or two words. And then we, we travel back to present day and then I look at people with, you know, smiles on their faces and like they've gone through an amazing experience. And then I ask people, so what is the first word 
that comes to mind? What was the word you were thinking about? And the, the first word that comes to people's minds in over 50% of the cases is the word freedom. And then followed by words like joy and excitement and so on. So the word freedom is associated with the bicycle. It's a freedom tool. It allows us to roam. And it's actually the first tool that we all have to escape our own home. You know, when we were kids, the bike was how we got outside and, and escaped from, you know, our parents. And that still sits in us, every single one of us. And I, I've even sometimes I've, um, I've spoken to elders who've never owned a bike. And even people who haven't actually been on a bike before, they still associate the bike with freedom. So I think that's, that's a, an, an amazing uh, thing. And I think that's the reason why, as you, you, know, you see on the map here, that it uh, appeals to people all over the world, even if they come from a, from a city that may not boast great cycling infrastructure. I mean, we have chapters in cities like Los Angeles and New York and uh, Singapore, places where it's either too hot or too cold or too windy or not enough bike lanes and too many cars, and people still love these bike rides. And I think it is associated with the, you know, just the emotions that come up and the fact that we just get stimulated, you know, our senses. We have all these amazing studies as well that if you um, stimulate the senses, the sense of smell, and you've, you know, you feel the wind through your hair, all of that makes you happy. And that happiness can last for several days. So elders go back to the nursing home and people who work in the nursing home will report back that that sensation is carrying through to all the other residents. So it actually has all these positive repercussions. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed too, you, you mentioned specifically the nursing home and talk a little bit about the name, the, the origin of the name, Cycling Without Age. Yeah, it's, it's a funny story because it was one of the first chapters outside of Copenhagen that got started uh, in the northern part of uh, Jutland in Denmark. And um, I was in very close contact with um, the, the woman who was setting up the chapter up in, in the town of Jöin. And, and she was a nurse. And uh, we were in maybe on, we were talking on the phone several times a day. I helped her procure the, the trishaw bikes and we got the whole thing set up. And then it was all running and uh, didn't get that many phone calls anymore. And then one day she calls me, and this is like in the very, very early days. And she says, you won't believe what happened today. So we had this uh, woman as a passenger in her early 90s, and she was partially sighted. So she was nearly blind. And then there were a bunch of young people out uh, be, to be trained as volunteer pilots. We call the volunteers pilots. And uh, one of them was really curious. And she said to this lady, so what do you get out of being out in nature and out in the forest when you can't see anything? And she said, well, young man you know, I can, I can still smell the flowers and I can, I can hear the birds and I can feel the wind in my hair. And so um, Mireille, the, the, the nurse who was running the chapter, she, uh, she, she wrote back to me with an email and she said, you know, won't believe this. And she said, and then she explained that story. And I got so inspired by that. I've never met that woman, but I've seen pictures of her. And we decided that that encapsulated what we were all about. Because it's something that, uh, of course, we all know it. And if we start noticing it, we feel that wind and eye. But it's nothing that we think about on a daily basis. But once you don't have it, so if you're an elderly person and you've lost your mobility and you finally get back outside again, you start to notice all these different things that we all take for granted. And one of them is feeling the sensation of the wind, feeling the breeze. And that is just absolutely amazing. Yeah. And uh, Gary, you and I were saying you know, a picture sometimes is worth a thousand words. So here's a picture. You can actually see the wind in her hair. <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. And that smile, that, that, that enthusiasm that comes with that. Gary, talk a little bit about what this program has meant for you personally and your wife, uh, you know, to be able to, to, to be pilots and to, to, be the ringleaders bringing this to your community well the the two women you see in that photo uh the woman closest is judy's mom my mom mother-in-law and the other is of course my mom 
And they were our guinea pigs. Uh, Judy and I had to train on a trishaw before we could train other pilots. And so they were the guinea pigs. And getting back to what Oli said, you know, I, I asked Myrna, my mother-in-law, I said, so Myrna, when's the last time you were on a bike? And she says, it's been a while. And then she went on to relate, she grew up in Golden, uh, which is a small community west of Denver. And she says, I, I used to ride my bike a lot. And so we're talking the 1930s. She would have had one of these balloon tire women's bicycles. And she says one day she started riding up Lookout Mountain <laughs> on a bike that probably weighs 50 pounds. And uh, she, got, she got pretty high on the mountain when she thought it was about time to get back down. And, and then another time she says, and you'd have to know Denver a little bit, but she took off uh, following uh, Clear Creek and into Denver and wound up at Elitch Gardens, which is northwest Denver. And, you know, that's a good 10 to 15 miles from Golden. And this, this is a young girl. You talk about freedom. And uh, she thought, you know, it might be time for me to head back to Golden. So th these are the memories that she shared. And, and the Trishaw was the vehicle through which she was able to share some of these memories, very fond memories that she has. And again, it gets back to the idea of freedom. We've had some amazing experiences with uh, the residents. Getting back to feedback, Sarah, Sarah Schoeder was, is the wellness director at Eaton, where we operate. And, and there's a photo of, uh, oops, there's a photo of Ole and four Trishaws out in front of Eaton. And we're all waving at the camera. Sarah is one of them. And I approached Eaton because they're a nonprofit home for uh, seniors. So Sarah and I had a meeting and she says, well, I'll take this to the leadership. And I think we, we've got to go to be the first Cycling Without Age program here in Colorado. And so we've been doing it a while, sharing some great stories. And one day Sarah says to me, she says, uh, Gary, you have no idea what this program means to our community. And I said, sure I do. People are smiling and they thank me for the rides. And she said, no, you don't get it. I work here eight hours a day, and I'm telling you, these rides are transformative. And, and she says, we've had people with dementia who are starting to open up. We've got people who didn't talk or who are suffering from paranoia start to open up. And uh, people start sharing these stories. So I thought I had an understanding, but when a professional tells me that it has that big of an impact, then you know you're you're doing something good. Yeah, it's not to say that a smile isn't it isn't amazing. It, it is amazing, but yeah, when it's more than just a smile, when it has that really truly meaningful impact on uh, on well being, and uh, yeah, I mean it, it's it's it, it almost it gives me you know goosebumps <laughs> just to 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 be thinking about this, uh, and it, it also kind of occurs to me too that. It also provides a level of empowerment and and a release for you know people who maybe it isn't age, maybe it is as you mentioned, Ole, maybe it is something like a debilitating early onset disease, or maybe it could even be a child who has you know something like cerebral palsy or something like that, where they're just not able to do the same level and be able to experience it. So I would imagine you have a similar type of profound impact, you know, for, for those individuals. Yeah, we have, um, I mean, we're called cycling without age, but it doesn't mean that uh, it's only about providing uh, these transformative rides uh, to people of age. Uh, it also means that we can do it. It's really, it's, it's become a metaphor as well, but it means uh, we want to provide these opportunities for everybody who, uh, regardless of age, regardless of ability. Um, and so we do have a lot of, uh, of, of chapters around the world who are actually mainly focusing on uh, people of all ages with um, some sort of uh, physical disability that won't allow them to ride a bike on their own. And I think also what it does is it, it does provide um, a sense of, of community and a sense of belonging. I think we all want to belong. Um, and and uh, probably one of the, 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 the biggest issues and the biggest problems that we have in this world today is the fact that there are so many people who feel socially isolated. 
whether they're in a care home, whether they're in their own homes, and it's people of all ages. And what we've come to realize with this program is that it's both our passengers and our pilots that gain from this sense of community, this sense of belonging. So when we're out riding, it has been described as a magic bubble that almost uh, uh, occurs when you're out on this bike. So you are usually uh, one volunteer pilot and then two passengers. And then suddenly this magic bubble appears and you can talk about anything and you can remember anything. And even if, uh, like I sometimes ride with elders who may have uh, memory issues. So, you know, one day they can remember a lot of things and the next day they can't remember a lot. And then so rather than trying to focus on that, we just work with imagination. And sometimes I may put myself in a situation where we're going down memory lane and I may be a completely different person with one or two passengers and we're maybe going down one of the busy streets of Copenhagen in the 1960s and having a ball. So I think it's about trying to sort of work on, on people's imagination as well and getting them to feel that they belong, that they're part of something bigger than themselves. And so by doing so, I've actually come to realize that we can offer something remarkable to volunteers as well. I have so many people of all ages, like we welcome students. We have a, a large student community uh, among volunteers in many cities around the world. And we also have a lot of people who themselves have reached uh, the age of, of uh, retirement and feel that this provides them with an opportunity to still be able to give back to society. And, and certainly to myself, and that's also, I guess, one of the reasons why one of our guiding principles is kindness, the feeling of being able to give something back to someone else and giving back to society is probably one of the greatest feelings that certainly I know, and I, I can see it in the eyes and the, just the, the, you know, the body language of volunteers who come for the first time and seeing the pride of mounting that bike and being able to take someone out for a bike ride. That is a truly remarkable feeling. Yeah, yeah. So Gary, you sent this photo along, which made me smile. Okay, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> so the first pilot to join Judy and I is the wife of the gentleman you see piloting the Trisha. And, and she, Wendy Bristol's been with me for five and a half years. This is her husband, Randy Bristol, and he works with a program in Denver, Trips for Kids. And he's been named twice Volunteer of the Year, taking kids with uh, who are perhaps underserved, uh, kids of color, and introducing them to mountain bike riding. Well, and this is their oldest daughter. And they thought, you know, the only way to get her to the wedding, since we're an active family, is in the Trisha. So that's the father of the bride, and they're on the way to a wedding. In, in one of our tri shots. So I love it. I love it. It's not really not it's not really true. It's not the only way to get to the wedding, but it's really it's going in style. Yeah. <laughs> she could have ridden her bike, of course, as they probably do in Copenhagen. <laughs> they do. Yeah, they do. They do for sure. Uh, so Oli, the, the thought occurs to me that, you know, people who are tuning into this, who maybe they already know about cycling without age, or, and this is sort of a, a gentle reminder, or maybe they're, they're learning about this for the very first time. I know that out on the website, we've got, uh, you know, a page here of what it means or what the steps are, but sort of just walk us through this process of what it takes to become an affiliate and, and create a chapter and, and really, you know, how, how difficult is it? I mean, obviously it was a little easier for, for, for Gary, given the amount of, of history that he had from an advocacy perspective. But if somebody's just learning about this, you know, how, how is it, how easy is it? And what is it you're looking for? I think you mentioned a couple of little nuggets there as to what you're looking for, but walk us through that process. Yes. Um, so we call people who want to start a chapter, we call them affiliates. So as you can see on the screen here, we have the affiliate agreement, which is kind of a social contract. Um, and what we're looking for, uh, we're looking for people who have a desire to make a difference. 
And we don't, they don't necessarily need to be bicycle advocates. I mean, that certainly helps, but we have people who have a desire to make a difference in a lot of different areas. So it could be people who have been working uh, with people with disabilities, or it could be people who have, maybe they're working in a, in a care home. It could even be someone who actually represents the care home, but usually it's 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 someone who has the desire to put one or two or three or four of these trishaws into the local community because they can see that they can transform that local community the way that Gary described in Lakewood as well. And then what we do is uh, once we receive uh, the application of uh, someone who wants to become an affiliate, we read through it. Uh, we usually take a call with them. We try and understand why uh, why have they come to us? How have they found us? Do they have a, a good network? But so um, above all, we want people to form a small group of like-minded people with like different capabilities, different competencies, so that they can share in their successes, but they can also uh, help each other when the going gets tough sometimes because... Of course, part of setting up a chapter is that you got to fundraise for a trishaw, and a trishaw is 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 not cheap. It's a, it's a it's a fairly expensive piece of equipment. So with you know shipment and everything, it it costs over ten thousand US dollars. So it's 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 fairly expensive. But like we talked about earlier on, it's uh, it's also it's carrying precious cargo. So we want to make sure that these bikes are really really good quality. Um, so once that, that group is set up. Uh, and you've you started the fundraising, you've started reaching out to build relationships with the local community. Like in, in Lakewood, it was about finding a, a good uh, nursing home. In some cases, it's also about setting up maybe a relationship with the local university to get volunteers, the local businesses for, uh, for, for funding for the bikes. Uh, we find very often that it's very easy to walk down to the local, maybe to the local high street, and speak to the local shop owners and get them to get on board. Get maybe the local cafe to sponsor free coffee when you're out cycling, things like that. And then uh, you, you sort of start to build momentum. And the average time it takes for, from someone has discovered cycling without age until they have an active trishaw in the local community is probably about three months. We do our utmost, of course, to uh, to help and to to cheer on that team. Uh, and we we all we've built uh, like a global community. So so existing chapters help new chapters get started and uh, give them experience. So we also have this online community where people help each other in many many different ways, finding insurance and ideas for fundraising and ideas for attracting volunteers and retaining them and so on as well. So that's, uh, that's kind of that infrastructure that we've built. Yeah, fantastic. And Gary, from, from the standpoint of where you're at and what you're trying to do in Lakewood, and, and I know that this is not a photo of Lakewood, <laughs> uh, but uh, what, what's that like? I mean, what's the nitty gritty of trying to keep this rolling and keep the momentum uh, rolling along and, and being successful? Yeah, I, I do want to address this photo for a, a moment. This was the second North American Summit Conference for Cycling Without Age. And in this photo, you're seeing, well, this is in Canmore, Canada, which is absolutely gorgeous. And what you're looking at is a community of people. There's people from California in this photo, Colorado, both Alberta and British Columbia, Colorado, and Copenhagen. And I know, John, you can relate to this because you're part of a community of healthy living and sustainable transportation. And, and by joining this community, I now have associates in other countries, you know, people that I call friends to share the experience with. Getting back to Lakewood, one of my good friends who was a top level racer, you know, I literally forced her to sit down in a chair you know, she, she was a manager for visiting angels, doing a lot of health home care for, for seniors. And, and I said, you, you're going to watch this video. Sit down, turn the phone off and watch. And she became one of my pilots. And then she started the chapter in Littleton. And Littleton is just going gangbusters. 
they will soon have five tri shahs. They've got 40 to 50 volunteers working. I, I trained Ed Witten, who started a chapter in Boulder, and he's been very active in reaching out to other communities that are interested. So he will soon have either directly or indirectly, eight tri operating in Colorado, including one up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And so when I started, I was the only active chapter. There were, I think, six chapters who had not succeeded in fundraising or, or whatever. We will have uh, five active chapters that I know of, six active chapters, and somewhere between 15 and 20 tri operating in Colorado. So we're not on a par with Wisconsin yet, but uh, I, I think we're, we're starting to make an impact. And like Oli says, we help each other. You know, yeah. each of us, we're volunteers. This is strictly volunteer driven, but each of us brings different uh, skill sets to the table. I brought a bullheaded stubbornness that said, nobody's going to stop me from doing this. Barb well, good, is, I guess uh, it was a marketing. good thing that it, it, it happened easily, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> relatively so. Yeah, I, I don't know that it was easy. Uh, raising that first ten thousand dollars caused me some yeah. sleepless nights. Um, so, so they, Gary, I mean, let's uh, let's get down to brass taxes here. I mean, what's what's the hardest thing to keep this momentum going? Well, I think fundraising to get it started. I, I was able to get eaten on board fairly easily because they're number one, they're a nonprofit. They don't have to satisfy a board of directors with bottom line thinking and, and they're willing to experiment. I, I know Barb's case in Littleton, she was working with a lot of uh, for-profit home centers and it, it, she beat the bushes for like a year. You know, she'd work with the CEO and for six months. And then next thing she knows, that CEO's either been transferred to another organization or has been fired and you start the process all over again. So, so you need a place that's willing to work with you. You need to do some fundraising and then you need to hang on to the volunteers. I I've trained somewhere between 40 and 50 pilots and have lost most of them on the good side. They've gone out and started their own chapters. So uh-huh. in that way it's helped us grow. But life intervenes. You know, one of my good pilots is said, you know, Gary, I'm leaving. We're going to uh, uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, because we just had a granddaughter and we're going to be involved. Yeah. yeah. So, so she's life, life gets in the way and, and yeah, being able you know, to spend time with the grandkids is, is key. Ole, why don't you sort of uh, amplify what are some of the biggest challenges that uh, affiliates have when they want to start a chapter and, uh, you know, something other than what, if there's anything other than what uh, Gary just mentioned and, and how can they overcome those challenges? Yeah, I, I, I fully support uh, all the statements that you just made, Gary. I, th- I think uh, these are some of the major challenges. Of course, the, the fundraising, we do have actually, we have actually found a way of tapping into a lot of, um, grants uh, that exist in all states in the US. And we basically work with them in, I think uh, it's something called the CMP grants, uh, the reinvestment program, and it, it's available in all states. Uh, we have it, uh, I think now in five or six different states. So so we're beginning to address that, but, but other than that, I think keeping the level of activity high uh, and retaining volunteers can sometimes be a challenge. and. I've been working with volunteers in many different other sectors, uh, and I know that it's, uh, it's, it's, it's nothing special to Cycling Without Age because, of course, it's the nature of volunteering is that you don't get paid for it. So you usually have a full-time job, so you have other priorities as well. Life gets in the way and so on. And I don't take that as a defeat that people don't stay for a very, very long time. So if, we, if, if you take a group of 100 volunteer pilots, maybe 10 of them will stay for a long time. 10 will only have one ride. And then you'll have a a section of people who may only ride occasionally. um, And then they'll maybe stop after a period of time because they move away or whatever it might be. And then you have people who ride fairly regularly as well. And so what I'm really curious about is what is it that makes the experience of being a pilot appealing 
in the long term as well. And what I've found is that if we create uh, a, uh, a sense of community, it means a lot so that people actually know each other because we, we, we have seen chapters as well where people go out riding on their own and they don't really meet other volunteers. So doing community rides where you have several bikes out, we actually had a bunch of American students uh, volunteering in Copenhagen in, in this past semester. We have a, a, an English language uh, university in Copenhagen and there are about 1300 uh, students from the US. And so we recruit, we're part of the activity fair, and we're actually going to go there next week and see if we can recruit for the next semester as well. But what we found was that what really engages those young people to, to, to ride a lot and to ride regularly is that we actually have two volunteers per bike. So we have one volunteer riding the bike and one being a co-passenger together with one of the residents from the nursing home. And then very often they go out two bikes. So that means they'll actually have, there'll be four students having that shared experience, which they can talk about afterwards. And they can, they can, they can share in the memories of that ride. So they've started doing all sorts of experiments. Like they go out to museums, they go out to cafes. They really get to know these people. And, and this group that, um, that uh, were volunteers in this past semester, they created a small four minute video where they all gave their testimony of their experiences of, of being pilots in Cycling Without Age and how they made friends with, uh, with these residents who were maybe four times their own age. And, and so I really got to realize that what gets people going and what retains this sense of community is that you get people together and you get people to share the experiences. So that's what we're focusing on a lot. Um, there are some beautiful chapters in Germany, for instance, who also uh, have a pilot night every single week. So people show up at the local pub and they, they don't ride, but they get to know each other. They share stories and they have a good time. So it becomes like, uh, you know, it's, it's a, you, know you're, you feel like you're part of a community, right? So that makes a, that's, that makes a huge difference. Yeah. Yeah. It's great. So. I want to pull up this this photo here just as a as a platform for talking about something slightly different and that is both of you sort of have this history of bicycle advocacy and and trying to work towards getting more people riding cycling <laughs> more often and, and 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 that is you know do we think that we have do we have any 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 empirical evidence that the cycling without age affiliates and the cycling without age chapters are helping to move the needle forward, move the progress forward uh, towards creating safer all ages and abilities facilities for people to ride. I, I'm going to let Ole address that because I know that there's some research that's going on to our, our hub. Certainly we've got some empirical evidence in. Ole, why don't you chime in and then I'm going to add to it. Yeah. Um, well, I've, first, let me uh, give you some little anecdotal evidence, because I was in Los Angeles uh, some years ago helping to set up a local chapter in the St. Gabriel area. And they had fundraised for a, a couple of tri shows and they'd set up this, um, this kickoff event. And there was one of the, uh, the local politicians from that area who came down to cut the ribbon and to be there to show his support. And I think maybe even the, the, the local municipality had helped fundraise for the bikes. And then before we were, you know, cutting the ribbon and all the official stuff was going on, I was standing there chatting to him. And he said to me, I'm actually, I'm not actually a cyclist. And I don't really know why we should be investing uh, all that money in cycling infrastructure, because I think the, you know, the, the local community works beautifully without that. So, but anyway, um, I'm, I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you can make a difference to our elders. And then, you know, we had some, he, he did a talk and I did a talk. And then I said to him, I'd like to invite you out for a ride in one of our tri -shows. And he said, yeah, I'd love to. Uh, and I said, because you can probably show me around. So I, I invited him along, he got onto the tri shore and we started cycling around. I said, you show me where to go. And so we, we took a left turn and we took a right turn and uh, he knew obviously exactly where we were gonna go. 
And he said, Bob, you know, but don't take the next one left because that's a really busy intersection. And, you know, we can't go in that direction. Uh, but we managed to get a really nice ride around. And there were some beautiful, small, quiet streets in the neighborhood. And we came back after maybe 15, 20 minutes. And he said to me, he kept, he kept, he was in his, his seat and he turned around and looked at me and he said, now I know what you're talking about because I, now I can see from this seat of this trishaw, I can see how unsuitable our environment is for, for safe cycling. And I can also see how important it is that people cycle because suddenly you get to experience your city in a completely new way. Suddenly you're not, you're not sitting inside uh, like a sardine box. You are actually out there interacting with people. Like we actually stopped a couple of times to greet people that he knew. And of course, had he been in a car, he would have never been able to just stop and have that conversation. So, so he said, now I, now I understand. And, and so it, it cut me thinking that that trishaw was almost like a Trojan horse of, of, of cycling because that, that made him open his eyes and open his wallet to making physical changes in the local environment. Yeah. Gary, go ahead. Yeah. It, there, there is a photo from the Oshkosh was, uh, conference, and you'll see uh, um, four, four women standing around a table, and there's uh, a, a slide up on the projector. This, this was at Oshkosh, and one of the most profound things that was said was by the president of uh, Miravita Living, Teresa Bertram. And, you know, I, I wrote this down. She's been involved in elderly care and has explored elderly care all around the world and talks about the strengths and weaknesses of different models. And, and the quote that I wrote down, and it's on that slide, is the number one predictor of health and happiness for the elderly is the quantity and quality of their relationships. And and that's one of the reasons she's such a big supporter of cycling without age is it is an opportunity to build these relationships and and these relationships yeah that that's the photo the woman with the blonde hair uh kind of left center she she's the president and next to her is the vice president and put together a wonderful conference you know which is building up the uh community of pilots, but, but that's the quote. And, and to take that one step further, I, I was interviewed by a local radio, uh, television station and it's a short, short little piece, but you know, they cut a it's by 15 minute interview turns into a 30 second sound bite. But the one sound bite is I'm quoted as saying, who gets more out of this, the pilot or the passenger? And then I shrugged and I said, it's a toss up. And, uh, you know, one of our first rides, I, I was with a, a gentleman from Eaton and uh, he and a companion are in the trisha. And I, I say to him, um, oh, he, he said, I've just given up my pilot's license. Doctor says I shouldn't be flying anymore. And I said, oh, well, were you in the military or the airlines? He said, no, 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 no. I, I just flew for my business. And I said, well, what business are you in? And he says, well, does the address uh, 6800 West Alameda mean anything to you? And I go, well, yeah, yeah, I grew up around here. Well, I was the founder and operator of the Roller City Rink here for 37 years. Turns out he probably taught me how to roller skate when I was eight years old. And, and when we introduced roller skating to our kids, he was still operating that. And that, that is really profound to interact with somebody at that level, you know, uh, to come full circle. You know, it's not somebody I knew when I was eight, but to realize the impact they had on me when I was eight years old and then be able to take them out for a ride is uh, it, it's a remarkable experience. Yeah. And, and I've had that on more than one occasion. You start a conversation and. You, you're going to teach them something about something and, that, and then they start teaching you because maybe they used to work there right. or it's just. Yeah. So that, that's the other side of it is I, I think the pilots that stay get so much out of it. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, Ole, final word for you. Uh, what, any, any final thoughts, anything that we haven't covered yet that you think the audience really needs to hear about this program? Well, I think I, I, I said at the end of my TED Talk, I said it's all about relationships, and I, 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 I cannot repeat that enough. So I, uh, of course, the, the gentleman on the bench uh, back in 2012, uh, his name was Torquil, and um, he became a really, really good friend of mine. He died at the age of uh, nearly 101, five years after we got to know each other. Uh, an absolutely wonderful person who also had so much wisdom in him. And I think what I have come to understand, I mean, these conversations we have, this storytelling back and forth, where I tell him about present day situations and issues, and he can tell me, he can give me the historical perspective and he can give me wisdom of, of yesterday. And he gave me so many wonderful little stories and things that I have been able to bring with me. And, and of course, it's the nature of, of cycling without age that you are, you're dealing with people of age. And so you're bound to lose uh, friends along the way, but also it makes you uh, cherish life and your relationships as you go along because you are going to build a lot of them. Uh, in cycling without age. I love it. Gary, final thoughts, final nuggets of wisdom from you. Well, you know, as, as much as the uh, organization has grown internationally, it, it's hard to meet all of the needs. If we have 20 trishaws operating, we could easily put 40 to work. And I think it gets back to uh, sustainable transportation. The, the fact that we are so car dependent really feeds into the social isolation. And I think of uh, your friends, Chris and Melissa Bruntlett, uh, living in Delft and they're bur curbing traffic. And, and one of their first group of neighbors, four, four gentlemen who are all brothers, grew up in the area, one of whom is suffering from dementia. And at the time they wrote the book, the other brothers could check in with him occasionally, but he could still navigate the neighborhood. Uh, get you know get to the store and take care of his basic needs and even though there were memory issues and things like that just living in a community where you're not a hundred percent car dependent it, it really helps to eliminate that social isolation and since we don't have that since we do have too much car independent car dependency it's great that we can get people re-involved in the community and get them out and about and establish these relationships. It, it's kind of the anecdote to car dependency. And, and I'll just leave it there. And a great place to leave it. <laughs> Gary and Oli, it has been such a pleasure and honor having you on the Active Towns podcast. Thank you so very much. Thank you so much, Sean. Thank you. And Oli, it's good to see you again, as always. It's good to see you, Gary. Hey, thank you all so very much. I hope you enjoyed this episode on Cycling Without Age with Gary and Ole. And if you did, please give it a thumbs up, leave a comment down below and share it with a friend. Yes, especially share it with a friend. This is definitely an initiative that needs to continue spreading around the world, even more so than it already has. And if you haven't already done so, I'd be honored to have you subscribe to the channel. Uh, just hit that subscription button down below and ring the notifications bell and select your notification preferences. So if you want all notifications and be sure to actually highlight all and then we'll get them all again thank you so very much for tuning in uh, i will be back next week with another episode on the active towns podcast on the active towns channel and until then this is john signing off by wishing you much activity health and happiness cheers and again, sending a huge thank you out to all my Active Towns ambassadors supporting the channel on Patreon, Buy Me a Coffee, YouTube Super Thanks, as well as making contributions to the nonprofit and purchasing things from the Active Towns store. Every little bit adds up and it's much appreciated. Thank you all so much. <laughs>